Hello, this is Haku the Bean, and today we are going to be reading some D&D horror stories. I've got five stories here, that should be enough for the video link that we want to go for. If you like this video, please leave a like on the video, comment down below, and subscribe to the channel. Now let's get right into this. With the first story, the main character problem player, and the CE character problem player. I'm not sure what CE character means. For you, it, I hold no bad feelings for anyone in the group, and hold many of them in friendly regard. If you're reading this, my friends, I hope you enjoy the nonsense of what happened. Alright, where to begin? So back before the pandemic, I had just started getting into D&D, and was nearly obsessed with it. A bunch of my peers were as well. So we had this idea to get together to do a D&D campaign together. It started off as a one-shot, but after uh, we decided to keep going. The characters. The DM, a friend of mine for a couple of years, and a fairly experienced DM. The sorcerer, an experienced D&D player, I primarily played 3.5 edition though, and we were doing in 5th edition and was playing a chaotic, evil, tiefling sorcerer. Interesting. The Warlock. A newcomer to D&D, he played no Warlock, whose patron was the sorcerer's father. At the time, he wasn't much into roleplay and stayed more in the back of the party, only saying things when he felt comfortable doing so. The Druid. A high elf druid, or maybe wood elf, I forget. Clearly not important to the story if you forgot that much about them. The Dark Elf Ranger, the year ranger from um, now on. A player who joined in lights of the campaign. They weren't the most experienced player, but they seemed to enjoy it nonetheless. The Wood Elf Ranger, WE Ranger from now on. Another new armor um, to D&D. &D. Looks like we got a lot of people here and we still don't know who the problem is. The first session went absolutely perfectly. It starts off with the party, not including Dark Elf Ranger at the time, on the way to a mine that had taken over, that had been taken over by thugs and bandits. But not the most flashy. Not the most flashy, but hey, it was many of our first campaigns, so it didn't need to be much. We started in a tavern with a few thugs, ugly looking people, entering it. They seemed to be scanning the tavern discreetly, but was noticed by Wood Elf Ranger and Ruid. And Druid. They told old sorcerer about it and decided to have a little fun. He knows that the thugs were writing something down on a notepad, so he used for this agent to erase whatever they were writing. The thug looks at notepad, confused before continuing. The sorcerer repeats, and the thug goes on high alert, looking for whoever was causing the issues. The sorcerer er, 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 proceeds to use precipitation, I hate that word, to give the thug a mustache, like the one that the mustache twirling villain tropes would have. Oh ho ho, yeah, I know the mustache. Everyone starts laughing, and from then on, we call the campaign Big Mustache. That is a pretty funny situation. The first session goes as well as everyone expected. No issues were found at the beginning at all. There was some pretty lore-filled stuff discovered in it as well, and Wood Elf, Ra Wood Elf Ranger had mood swings between XD and naked intrigue over what they implied. A red flag for what was to come, though not an obvious one at the time. There wasn't much in the way of story for the next couple sessions, as a lot of stuff we were doing was grinding for money, reputation, and experience, both in and out of game. We had transitioned to an online format since the pandemic. At this point, was in full swing, but everyone was still pretty engaged. You might notice that I have really odd pauses because I think it, it's the end of the sentence. 
There was a point, however, where Druid was going around town and noticed a lot of animals caged up. Druid tells the party about this, and Sorcerer, in a private conversation, proposes that they let the animals out. Druid agrees, and the of them set fire to the animal purchasing area of the town, causing quite the hysteria in town. This was the first warning signs that things would only go downhill, as what else Granger made clear, explaining that their character would not approve of those actions. Fast forward and what else and what elf ranger begins trying to direct the party to go faster and not get sidetracked, which was only emphasized by the fact that the website we were using was finicky and often took a long time to set up in the moment. Hmm, sounds like roll twenty. That's the reason why I stopped playing on that website. The DM then usually prepare the stuff beforehand, so the party you would often be left standing around away for the DM to let them keep going. Again, this was the first campaign for many of us, and the first online one for all of us. Fast forward a few sessions, and we eventually reached a new ruined city that had been completely taken over by goblins. Dark Elf Ranger had been enjoying the sessions, but not in character yet. DM says he has a plan for them, so Dark Elf Ranger is just spectating at the time. What Elf Ranger urges suggests using stealth to infiltrate the town, but Sorcerer ignores most of what the party thinks, and just strolls right in. What Elf Ranger is infuriated with Sorcerer's blatant ignorance to his suggestions and doesn't join Sorcerer, temporarily splitting the party. I should mention at this point that Sorcerer had a bit of a misconception about the rules. I'm sure all of you know the rule where you can only cast one leveled spell per turn. Well, Sorcerer didn't know about that, so they took Quicken spell, thinking that they could cast two magic missiles every turn, early demolishing any target he chose. What if Ranger was feeling threatened by this and many of the combat dynamic that was going on? So they were getting more aggressive to Sorcerer trying to get them to back off a bit more. Well, anyways, Sorcerer strolls right into the ruined city with goblins, to find the goblins lived in a society where the strongest ruled. He fought the current goblin champion, who had a locket of shield on them, allowing shield to be cast at once. But Sorcerer still dominated. We were at level 3 at this point, but Sorcerer, through the misconception of rules, or it needed one time to eliminate anything. Sorcerer does so and finds that the goblins actually had three separate tribes with one all powerful ruler. That ruler? Dark Elf Ranger. Memory is stripped, thrust upon that position without warning. Wood Elf Ranger begins panicking and having done a lot of monster research, respect that ever intelligent their, their intellect devours nearby. It also didn't help their paranoia that early in the campaign they had found that their aberrations, use, using that one where Andrew ability where you can sense nearby creatures like undead, celestial, etc. I forgot the name. Dark Elf Ranger joins the party and submits to Sorcerer's threats, allowing Sorcerer to become the new king of the goblins. We all decide to leave the city and Sorcerer brings every goblin with them. They begin returning to whence they came, at Wood Elf Ranger's vigorous request at Sorcerer to leave the goblins behind. This all culminates in with one event where we find and ourselves at, at a town to rest at. Sorcerer orders the goblins to search the town, hunting for any and all valuable items to bring back to him. The goblins do so, effectively terrorizing the town. Wood Elf Ranger was horrified by the, his actions. And in a fit of main character syndrome, attempted to assassinate Sorcerer. It didn't work, naturally, and at this point, the entire party falls apart. What else, Ranger? Storms off, metaphorically, so not an online game. And everyone else is left to sort of wander off over time. DM tries to reconcile with what else, Ranger? 
with what elf ranger, but what elf ranger was having none of it. They were accusing sorcerer of fudging dice rolls and being unbalanced and having an overly dominating presence the party. No one found the rule about one leveled spell per turn until about a year later. Anyways, hello, what elf rangers are here? This horror story wasn't one where there was only one person at fault. It was mostly in so me and Sorcerer that were the problem players. I'm sure many of you know about the tropes of CE characters. What does CE stand for here? Like Sorcerer or dominating main character players, like me at the time. This was an unfortunate situation where both of those came to light in opposition to each other. Oh, chaotic evil! Sheesh. This situation happened during the height of the pandemic as well, so that certainly didn't help things. Thanks for reading, and be sure to tell me how horrible a player I was in this situation. Sarcasm, don't worry. Although, I don't really want to hear anyone say how bad of a player person was, because most of us were new, and this was online. During a major event where most of us were starved for attention. Alright, now to the second story. First of all, here's some light to make sure that you go blind. We, want, we wouldn't want you to see too well. And apparently they don't want me to see too well either. I don't like this. Oh gosh. This is going to hurt to read. Look at how tightly packed that is. So me, Barbarian, and my friend, Bard Singer, had never played D&D &D before. But our friend, DM, had on, on several occasions. occasions. So we decided to start a campaign. Session 1 occurred and it was great. We opened the campaign with my character participating in a drinking contest. While Bart Slinger went around pickpocketing off of all the drunk people. All was going well. The dice were on my side. I was winning the drinking contest. Bart Slinger was getting so much money. And then another player, they were on the, here for one session before scheduling made them drop out. Opened a barrel outside the town, setting up a train of explosions. That was the catalyst to a goblin reign. 8. We spent the rest of the session switching between fighting off goblins and running back to the temple to get supplies. All in all, it was free. It was really fun. And then the after party happened. During the after party, Barcelona's character acted like a stereotypical bard. No problem, it was funny at the time. But in doing so, we met an NPC named Miles. Miles was your run of the a male, all, all innocent, naive clerk who didn't even know what adult fun times were. Bartslinger interacts with him um, and is immediately like, he seems here to be around me and starts acting awkward. It's funny at first, but for some reason, RTM latches onto this and is immediately set on finding more and more ways to get them stuck together. Because now it, it's suddenly. Not necessarily, it's just true, one true pairing. For the next six sessions, all social interactions and roleplay involves Miles in some capacity. You know, when I hear the name Miles, I'm just imagining Miles Morales, and I'm just thinking, wow, this is really not okay. Even getting to a point where the story wouldn't progress unless he was there. It didn't affect Bart Slinger all that much because any character that had her, because any chance that her character and Miles could interact was immediately going to happen. I, on the other hand, somehow got sidelined everywhere except combat. If we were in town and I wanted to participate in a drink contest, now it's duos and Miles is there with me. Also, somehow with advantage since he had poison reindeer. 
If I wanted to try and help of an NPC, I got exactly one check to try before Miles came over and did for me. If I decided to branch off and do my own thing, like within the same building, I didn't split the party. I got to interact with the NBC for maybe two sentences before we would cut back to Bartslinger and Miles seeing whatever they were doing. I had almost no impact, to the point that the DM actually forgot NPCs I contacted with or were important to my backstory. Whereas he, he let us know he are, already had Bartslinger's whole story quest ready as soon as we finished our current mission. And yes, Miles was vital to it. This eventually fell through almost because of scheduling. By the last session, I didn't even attempt to interact with anything outside of combat. And the story and everything involved remained entirely the same. By the end, I was only relevant during combat, when they needed me to stay alive. And to carry things, since I had the highest strength. TLDR, the DM basically turns campaign into a bard into Bartslinger's staying game, and I sit on the sidelines being a compact, a combat pack mule. Wow. I can get liking two characters being together, but you really need to um, make sure that everyone is involved. Am I the a-hole? Player refuses to create original or character. I recently got some friends and together to begin a new homebrew campaign. After creating some homebrew classes and races, my players began to create their characters. Two of my players create normal characters, but the third player, let's call him L, created an exact clone of Sam from the game Sam and Max. What's Sam and Max? The other players were understandably annoyed by this, and I talked to Elle about creating another character. After I asked him to change his character, he went on a rant about how D&D isn't supposed to have rules, and how he should be able to play whatever character he wants. We told him that we were fine with the character he was playing, but wanted him to at least change his name and appearance. But L still refused to ask me to show him the rule. Well, that said, he couldn't be a pre-existing character. I was not wondering if I, I'm being kind of reasonable about this, and just let him be the character he wants. Am I in a butthole? I mean... Uh, they're wrong about the game not really having rules. The rules are made up by the people who play it. The players and the DM. And yes, in the most D&D games, you can play whatever character you want. But you have to make sure that the characters fit the tone of the story. Like, at all. I don't know what Sam and Max is. I'll probably look it up later. <sighs> Actually, hang on. No, I'm not going to do that. My computer's already running slow right now. I don't need to be going even slower. But if the character doesn't seem to match the tone of the game you're trying to play, or you feel like it wouldn't work in the world you want to DM in, then you should probably tell oh, the player this. Like if you're are trying to play a serious, no obards, no oh, 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 joking in campaign, and then someone makes a clown character that is just to be a joke, then it's just gonna stick out like a sore thumb. Kind of like that one Family Guy clip where Peter's dressed like a clown while following a whole bunch of soldiers who are dressed up like army men. <laughs> anyway, it's really just depending on how everyone in the game feels.
I don't think anyone should be made to play an original character if they don't want to. I mean, for my part, when I want to play d and I mostly just want to be a cat girl that does insert class here. That's really all there is to it, just cat girl. Cat ears, doesn't it? Anyway. Player to her DM takes over campaign and runs it to the ground. I've been debating in, in posting this for a while because of who might run into this. But I thought I'd share. Sorry in advance for the long posts. TLDR at the end. Oh, this is going to be a long one. Some context before the main story. Since I introduced some of my friends to D&D, I've been the party's DM, and while I had some pre-written campaigns before, this was my first full hold and crew world and campaign. I discussed with my players and they agreed that they would be interested in playing a pirate themed campaign. So I spent some months working on this world to probably build the PC's backstories into this world. I was actually really proud of the final product and sorry this campaign inspired the ca this pirate inspired campaign with a total of six players. Now this is a definitely bigger group, but I got along with all the players well in the past, so at the beginning it was, no pun intended, smooth sailing. Six players. That's insane. I'm sorry, but I'm not playing a game where there are more than four. There has to be a small amount of players or else combat will take forever. Now, on to the actual story. One of the players was a friend of mine who had DM'd for me and a group, different group in the past. For this story, we'll call him Warlock. Now since I've known this guy for a while, I know that he likes power building. This will be important later. And while this is usually not an issue for me as a DM, I took this into consideration when building the encounters so they will so it'll be fun for the other players. At the very start of the campaign, the players meet my DMPC. Oh no. Who was originally not meant to stick around. That's good. He was simply made to deliver the main quest line to the players and eventually leave. However, as the PCs began developing connections with, the, with said DMPC, we agreed to let him stay as a companion for the party. As I was very strict on not letting him influence the story or player decisions more than he was meant to in in the first place. The campaign was going well, but due to some real life issues at the time that really burned me out, I had stepped down as DM, seeing as I didn't think it would be even fair to with my players if I kept running the sessions when I wasn't enjoying myself. Since they were really liking the campaign and I had the entire world of campaign that was compiled in a document, one of the players suggesting it having Warlock pick up where I left off, since he was the only other player who had DM'd in the past. Seeing as I was stepping away from the campaign, I agreed. The original plan was to move on and let them do their thing. But since we were friends outside of D&D sessions, they suggested I continue playing with them, but as a player, seeing as I wouldn't have the extra responsibilities of preparing and running the sessions every weekend, as I had been in doing so far. Reluctantly, I agreed because of how much I enjoyed the final product of the homebrew world, and since Warlock had now I had been given all the world and campaign information, I then adjusted the NPC so that he would work as an actual PC. As was before, he was made as a quest giver, so he was never really built for combat. From this moment on, everything goes downhill. Warlock seemed to throw all the notes I had out, had left out the window to make up his own thing, which would not have been a problem seeing as he was a DM. It had not been so drawing to the point that it almost felt like playing a completely different story. 
when the players are previously already halfway through. Ed felt as as if he hadn't bothered to read where the original quest line they were following was going, or to at least change or adapt it. It was more like he completely dropped it. The first issue was that it was something was impossible to die. No matter what we did, Warlock would never let any of our PCs hit zero hit points, because his CMPC would swoop in and save the, save the day. His CMPC was the character he had been playing while I was in while I was a DM. The one he had a power built as a DMPC, unaltered. Warlock kept the character with the party and would act, act effectively still play him actively as a PC. Oh no. This isn't good. Also, characters won't die because a DMPC will swoop in and save the day. That 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 reminds me of um the airship story. I won't say anything further on that. It's actually one of people who made me want to read it, it um the indie source in the first place. Well, there's a lot of YouTubers that do it, it, that though. There are a lot of um, D and D YouTubers that made me want to start reading D and D horror stories, like this one. The second issue, and the one that to this day I still don't have an explanation for, was what Warlock chose to do with my character's pet. My fighter had picked up a small mouse, and that you traveled around with. No stat block. The little this little guy was as good as flight protects. And Warlock started making jokes after the sessions about how he was going to kill the mouse since my fire liked it so much. Not the kind of joke I find funny, but fine. He wouldn't do it without a reason, right? Right? The next session comes around and my fighter decides to take some precautions with his mouse, seeing as we're like hands uh, as fighting some kind of serpent. So my fighter pokes some holes into a wooden box he had with them and was planning on leaving the mouse inside while oh, we fought. As I was describing how the fighter was going to protect the mouse inside the box, Warlock interrupts. As you're distracted with the box, a loud arch creature lunges from the birch from the bushes and snatches the mouse from your hands. And swallows it whole, killing it almost instantly. It was some homebrewed giant serpent. At this point, I'm almost at a loss for words because there is genuinely no reason why Warlock would kill my pet. And I was easily upset after that session, but still chose to keep rolling with it because this was a group of my friends. The third and last issue was the one that made me leave the campaign. One of the players, let's call him Rich, wants Vegas PC's death and have him rejoin the party later on. Please note that this was agreed upon with all of the players and the party was alright with this plan. Whoever, however, he, he never specified how. While well, post Rich to the Earth, the party ship was attacked by a Kraken. Now this was a major battle for our characters, and after 40 to 50 minutes of combat and draining a good th e course of the party's health, it looked like we may finally kill the Kraken soon when, as you worldly look upon the Kraken, you see a familiar figure on by the bow of the ship. As you might have guessed, it's Rich, back from the dead, with a brand new magical weapon. Rich deals the final blow to the Kraken, saving the day. Hooray. The situation, along with the fact that Warlock CMPC simply would not let us die, made the entire campaign and our struggles in combat feel incredibly pointless. The 
that was a breaking point for me to leave my own campaign, which from what I've heard fell apart after a few more sessions due to Warlock dropping it. Needless to say, I did not feel inclined to have him DM for me again. And for reasons outside of D&D, I ended up distancing myself from the entire group. Still hope to someday run this campaign as it was originally intended. TLDR, I create a, a homegrown world for a higher campaign for personal reasons, step down as the um, player in the campaign and picks up the role, convinced me to join as player and proceeds to throw consequences out the windows, has a DUX machina the NPC, and kills all my PC's pet for no apparent reason. Yeah, that last part of the TLDR, the part that really bugged me was just killing a something off that someone unlikes for no reason is incredibly weird and toxic. Like this warlock was a horrible DM. And who knows, maybe their experience in the past was the war was the airship story that is uh, so infamous among people who know what these stories are like. Anyway, now for the last story. Am I the asshole? New PCs, new DM. One player got really upset and confused. This is sort of a validation seeking post. In truth, in my third session of a new campaign last night, and as a brand new DM, a player got really angry and shouted at me. TLDR at the end. This is going to be a long post because I need to vent. Okay. Oh god, it's actually going to be longer than I thought. Okay, let's keep going. Some backstory. After completing one brief beginner or module, I decided to mesh a blend and a homebrew and third party the pre made sorry quest for my campaign. I'm familiar ish with DD systems that my group elected me to be their DM. They really seemed like they wanted to play, and I just want to emphasize that starting a family DD game was not my idea, but I was happy to make it happen. Family DD games are not very fun, for the most part. Not from my experience, anyway. Basically, everything I wrote takes place in a lore accurate Feyrun. But the BVEG and NPCs are original. I have over 10 years of RP and world building experience. <sighs> Just not in a group setting. Mainly one to one. Also, I've got diagnosed with untreated ADHD, but, and I'm positive it's been a huge hindrance here. The group. There's four players and none of them have a D&D experience. I'll give them fake names to make this explanation easier. Me, female, mid-twenties. Hey, I'm also a girl in her mid-twenties. DM. Jill, female, mid-thirties, a relative of mine, playing an asthma, er, an asthma ranger. Bob, male, early thirties. Jill's boyfriend, playing a dragonborn druid. Mandy, female, mid-teens. Jill's daughter, playing a tiefling barbarian. Sue, female, mid-teens. Mandy's best friend, playing a high elf rogue. None are familiar with TFR. I don't know what that acronym means, but I'm guessing it's something. I think it might be like the Fey Run or something. Not races, classes, or anything. I gave them what, three weeks to reveal the, a player's handbook and held two session zeros to guide them. 
welcoming extra calls on the weekend or evenings after work. We're all new, so I was fine with us reviewing and learning the game together, and encouraged them to reach out. For everyone, I offered optional pre-written characters, origins, backgrounds that tied into my story, and everyone except Maddie chose a pre-written en route. I had an hour-long call with Maddie to help her come up with an original character backstory, based on she didn't know where to start. We used such as COE and the player's handbook to use our tables. I helped everyone pick their classes, explain stats, etc. I'm not the best at explaining this stuff, so I upload a free PDF of the player's handbook to our Discord group and encourage them to read the sections that pertain to their race and class. Yeah, most people use the PDF of, of, of um, a lot of D&D stuff. Now, when you come up with, when you can easily pay $70 for a freaking book, then you can play it in my uh, uh, comments. But until then, keep your keyboard silent. I linked popular video guides for their chosen classes as well, uh, since only the teens read. The Indie Beyond was also utilized. I did a screen share call to show them how to use the character creation. The teens showed the most interest, makes sense. Sue in particular was great. She had a character sheet ready, sketched out her character, and had a lot more details and first touches to the three paragraph backstory I gave her character. Maddie followed suit once I helped her with the background and class details. It seems like, um, Young people usually get into these fun things a lot more than their um, parents or older or folk. I noticed this when I was playing D D D with my own family. Um, my siblings and I got really into the game, while my parents just lost interest over time. Jill and Bob did not do any research or, and showed common disinterest when since they were down and very excited to play. I made clear that they were not obligated. Jill wanted to be a tabaxi, but I discouraged it and said the, the, a campaign would probably work best for the genetic PC races since we're brand new. Well, that's just gonna ruin anyone's experience. Let them play tabaxi. That's cute. Tabaxis are, are cool. This might have been rude of me, not sure. She then went with Asmar, which was an ideal either, but did seem more workable than a backseat for this story. Asmars can fly! That's not on anywhere near workable in comparison to a tabaxi. Jill was cool about it either way. Tabaxis probably have those claws, but that's about uh, it. Asmars, aka bird people, are able to fly, and that is going to be incredibly I I hindering for your or game. My fault. I'll, uh, I'll elaborate a bit later, but I haven't been keeping track of every little detail of the PCs. You're not supposed to as a DM. Like, I'm not the most familiar on all their abilities and proficiencies and encourage them to learn how to play themselves. That is literally, you're, you're not uh, uh, supposed to know everything about their PCs. They have to keep track of their own, own character sheets. It's the least the players can do after... Or, or the DM makes the entire world and game around them. Unfortunately, they don't interact with much with the environment, don't explore, and I'm struggling to inspire this sort of behavior. Yeah, it's hard to get players to explore sometimes. You need to make them have, um, you need to um, make them roll perception and then encourage them to explore something. I mean, even in um, actual video games, it's hard to get players to explore without not uh, making something shiny or something. 
I also have forgotten to utilize NPCs in combat. My second session, an NPC sat out on the sidelines for the first half of combat before the PCs remind me she was there. Whoops. I tend to struggle for seeing multiple NPCs in a conversation as well. And I'm working on improv. Believe me, I have a hard time I'm making out of voices I make in the videos. Great RP has always been my strong suit, but verbal, not so much. I've also been fudging numbers a lot and shrinking enemy health bars, AC, and increasing damage output to make combat seem more risky. Yeah, a lot of DMs fudge numbers, don't worry. It's actually a common thing to do, and it, you have to do it to make either the game more enjoyable or to keep players from dying if you don't want them to. Because it does hurt when your first PC dies. I haven't had it happen yet because I never played a game that long. But it does hurt. Edit. This goes without saying, but I'm also very forgetful in general, and have asked players to call me out if they have any questions, and welcome constructive criticism. I've always self-doubt a lot, perhaps too much, and I said I'm doing fine so far, but I mean, there's a lot I obviously need to work on. Bob gets his own section in this post somehow. Bob then asked if he could do a druid or warlock multi-class hybrid thing that allowed him to transform into something like Groot from Guardians of the Galaxy. He also wanted a pact with a powerful nature god. I said he could go with druid or warlock for this, considering how multi-classing works, and discouraged it since he's new, and said we could homegrew some platforms he could take on he could take later on. He was not happy that he couldn't turn into a forest dragon or hulking swamp monster at level 1. I'll also add, everyone except Jill dislikes Bob. It isn't just the other players, it's everyone in my family. Damn, what the hell did Bob do? But I've been on good terms with him because I'm extremely non-confrontational, and he's never crossed me personally. Anyway, I screenshotted individual pages out of the player's handbook for him, tried to explain the druid class and dragonborn race. I made clear that it was complicated and would require research and prep to use properly. That's every spellcaster race. You have to be willing to do it. While everyone chooses normal names or setting, he comes up with a joke name. Sriracha. <laughs> and it's cracking fourth breaking fourth wall breaking jokes from session one, acting like he, he has a TV in his cottage, making fun of the inconsistent accents I give the NPCs, etc. etc. Okay, that is pretty rude. First of all, it is really hard to keep an accent inconsistent. Literally, I can't even do that with actual speaking accents I use in my everyday life because I have like 13 of them and I switch between them depending on my mood. I don't shut him down, of course. I laugh along I mean, because this is just a game, and at the day, I don't want to squash anyone's fun. But there is a vibe that he feels he's above RP and doesn't want to engage with the story from an in universe perspective. Whatever, it's fine. Last night. On average, I spend about 20 to 30 minutes before each session prepping, writing out an outline. I've also taken to writing recaps of previous sessions. Combat is a weak point for me, and I have trouble keeping in track of everyone's stats, weapons, etc. I'm also afraid it's boring for everyone. Another issue I've been working on is the players rely on me to know how their weapons work and what abilities they have. They should not be doing this, they should be looking to their character sheets and the player's handbook. We pause frequently because Bob and Joe don't know what they're wielding. They should know this. It should be on their er, er, er sheet. Maddie and Sue do it occasionally too, but not as consistently. None except Sue have done their research on class abilities, and I've had to remind them to keep track of their own equipment and inventories. 
I don't think that's my job as DM, right? It is not. Your job as DM is to tell the story. What uh, uh, the players are holding is supposed to be for them to ooh, keep track of. If you don't write it down, it doesn't exist. So if you ooh, ooh, get like 10 arrows for, uh, on something, you have to write those 10 arrows down immediately. Or else, they don't exist. They poof into nothing. Because you forgot to write it write down. Except with like your gold or whatever else you might have. They only swing their weapons for a time. And Bob and Joe just kept trying to throw their weapon into each turn. Which I had to discourage because... Why are you throwing everything? Just stab! Or fire arrows. Maddie's Barbarian never enters with rage. Sue tries to RP the most and talks to the bad guys, which is fine, but Bob gets visually, visibly agitated with her when she hesitates to enter combat. Bob doesn't know how any of his spells work. At the beginning of, the la of last night's third session, I walked everyone except Sue through leveling up. Lots of hand-holding, reading directly from the player's handbook sessions I'd asked them to review weeks ago. For Bob of Druid, I tried explaining spells. Since druids use concentration a lot. I began to explain concentration to him. He cuts me off a few sentences in by saying, We'll cover it when we get there. This is going in one ear and out the other. I back off. For him to say, okay, because sure, if he tries to use a concentration spell, I'll let him know it, how it works. I told him to look up each spell and save its description somewhere so he knows what it does, and I won't have to explain it for him. When he asks to use it. I mean sure you could have your or DM keep track of everything your uh, everything, but that is asking a lot and will impact the story of the game in a lot uh, more. And will make it a little bit a lower quality. Alright, so anyway, I have them I'm walking into the woods with two NBCs who are part of Sue's guild. I introduced them pretty thoroughly at the beginning end of the session. They leave the village and they stay then and, and enter the forest. Miss closes in, I go to attack. Sue has days because she doesn't want to hurt animals, and Bob chat asks her for never wanting to help the group in encounters. I attempt to de-escalate by saying these wolves are evil servants of the Vampire Lord and not quite natural, so it's okay if she has to kill them. The BBG Vampire Lord has beef with Joe's character because she stole something from him in her original in her origin story, so he shows up and asks the party to surrender her in exchange for Gifts beyond their wildest imaginations. Which secretly means he'll make them his spawn. Obviously they refuse and Jill's character runs, so I have them to attack another PC to punish her. And also kill one of the NPCs escorting them. I'm trying to make the fight more cinematic, and though he's too far off to kill while they're at third level, I plan on giving them a chance to get out of this. It's not going to be a TPK, and I'll day is like mocking them out of this if I have to. This is where I fear that by trying to make these in a magazine intense, I might feel like it might feel like railroading to them. I mean, that's probably what they want to do when the EBVG stabs Maddie's character. She fails the dex DC. I don't just have players get injured without a chance to save. I start with Bob and his face is red. And he starts shouting that the encounter is unfair. That he has no idea what's going on. And doesn't even know why they're in this position or who's fighting who. I stumble through an explanation of what... Happened in the past five minutes until a man's character has been stabbed and then an NPC got dragged into the mist screaming. He then basically says, Oh no, someone I don't even know just died. I'm so sad. Well, I guess I will attack the bad guy then. 
Not as exactly in words, but very mocking and sarcastic. His voice is raised the entire time, like he's actually pissed off. He continues on a tirade about not knowing what's going on at any point in the story. The other players try to help him explain, but it just sucks the wind from ourselves and things get really quiet. I'm a very sensitive person, so I say we'll leave the session on a cliffhanger and quickly wish everyone good night before hanging up to cry. Glass fell into paper or skin over here. <laughs> the session only lasted an hour and a half, when they usually last a little over two. I'm debating just canceling this game and starting one with just Maddie and Sue since they actually seem interested. Maybe I'll run a module with them since trying to kick off a homebrew campaign with little experience probably isn't doing me any favors. Neither Jill nor Bob have reached out since it happened. I don't expect Maddie or Sue to, obviously, but I don't know what I'm expecting here. An apology, maybe? TLDR, during combat, I introduce a BBG's attack by Lola of a party and taunt them in the middle of the encounter. A player starts yelling about how confused he is, doesn't know any of the NPCs that aims are with them after, and basically insinuates that I'm doing a really bad job at DMing. If you actually read the whole post, Jesus Christ, thank you for your time. I'd really love to be a player in D&D rather than a DM, so I might start looking at open groups in my community. I don't know if I'm cut out for DMing yet. But it'd be nice to try in the future. Yeah. All right. Almost an hour long. So much for a short video. That was r slash d d horror stories. If you liked this video, please leave a like on the video, comment down below, and subscribe to the channel. I have no idea what I'm going to be doing tomorrow, so until then, goodbye!